Now it doesn't matter if you have an elevation change of 10 feet or 300 feet like we have here in um, Minnesota or even close to 500 feet that we have over in southwest Wisconsin where we hunt. Deer love to relate to ridge tops and ridge top bedding areas. They also create a lot of great opportunity for hunting too, which we'll talk about at the end here. But I want to talk about how to make sure that your ridge top bedding areas are an actual bedding area. You know, for one, deer don't like to bed typically right up on top of the ridge. I was at a spot in uh, Iowa and someone had paid a lot of money to have someone hinge cut down a long finger ridge that extended for about 500 yards. They created a bunch of canopy hinge cuts we talk aren't that great of an idea anyways, with the thought that you're gonna bed right up under these hinge cuts on top of the ridge. But unfortunately, when you get those high northwest winds, and those really cold winds, those deer don't want to be exposed up in those winds, even if they have some sticks above them, some branches, some type of canopy. Again, all those leaves are gone. There's no side cover. There's no type of screening. So when it comes to ridgetop bedding, deer do like to relate to ridgetops to bed, but they don't like to bed on top of the ridge. The exception is during the summertime, they like that cool airflow. There are times during the hunting season where they might be on top of a ridge, but it's not during that wicked weather. So there's opportunity for them to bed on top, but really that side cover and what deer need extends far off of just the top of the ridge top and far off from just actual cover and certainly not canopy cover is what they need. So we're taking a ridge top up here that, you know, we have the option, we could have turned this into a food plot right here extending down this ridge and then hunt it off to the side of it. Leave it the way it was. We have a water hole down there that we're taking out of there and we're putting it down in a better spot down here. I can't wait to bring you that spot. That's an incredible spot. We talked about that in a, in a video a few videos ago um, sometime in mid-March, early March. We could have created more bedding and that's what we wanted to do here. That's very important. This is a 67 acre chunk. Now it connects to the rest of our property over here. I want to get the most out of this area. So we need to plan for deer bedding on either side of this ridge top. That's typically where they're going to bed, not necessarily right up here on top. This is a perfect opportunity to add switchgrass down the top of this. Now I'll talk about why I'm doing that and how that relates to everything. But when that switchgrass is growing, it has to have sunlight. So you can't just take an open hardwood top, plant switchgrass and expect it to grow. It's not going to. But the switchgrass alone doesn't create bedding. We have to have browse, daytime browse. So we accomplish both. If you have an open ridge top like this, if you have a ridge top that's exposed after logging, and you have sunlight, or you're simply cutting hardwoods down, you're getting sunlight to the ground, which could be the case of something like this or even look something like this, then what we're doing is the opportunity we're taking to create that high cover and value in the switchgrass and they were creating browse on top of that. So what we're doing is in here, I came through, I sprayed Simazine here in the spring. And of course we always show you these areas in subsequent years and what it looks like. But you can see right here easily, you know, we take the kick test, you can just, the soil's right there. You can see the soil when I kick it, it comes up, there's soil everywhere. There's areas where soil's already exposed. So I can put that switchgrass down to get good seed to soil contact. I can spray Simazine. Simazine doesn't hurt the switchgrass seed. It doesn't hurt that germination. It doesn't even hurt old switchgrass. It takes out a portion of the weeds that are going to come into this field area. When this greens up, the switchgrass won't germinate until mid-May at the earliest. Late May, we're having a cold spring right now. So I'm gonna hit this with a mixture of 2,4-D and glyphosate. Now take care of a huge percentage of the weeds. And then I'll mow as needed going forward if weeds are coming in here. So that'll establish the switchgrass. But if I allow these trees to grow up around us, and come into this area and shade out the switchgrass, then I'm gonna have an open hardwood top and there's not much reason for deer to bed on either side. We need diversity here, we need sunlight. So sunlight just doesn't help the switch. It helps the regeneration from the hardwood. Deer have to have browse two times during the day in their bedding hours. I don't want apple trees out here. I don't want food plot. I want the food plot over there so deer leave the bedding area before dark go out to their afternoon food source, feed until dark, we hold them there, and then they release and go to the neighbors, wherever that might be. So I want browse back here, and we can accomplish that with hardwood browse and regeneration. Right now we have a lot of briars coming in, we have weeds, we have various shrubs, shrub tips that deer are going to eat. So we have a little bit of food back here, but again, if I allow these hardwoods to grow around the switchgrass, I'm not going to have that. So the first step was simazine, applying and frosting the switchgrass, then the 2,4-D and glyphosate. Then we need to come in here 
it will take a lot of these hardwood species. If they're aspen, I'll cut them completely down. But when we get into a lot of the, the hickory, and if we have any oak along here, maple, we'll cut those at about waist high. Because once this is cut and hinge cut, I want that tree to fall back in the woods this way. So I'm taking all this branch structure that's gonna shade out the switchgrass and kill it. I'm putting this tree on the side. And then the deer can actually get to those tender hardwood regeneration shoots on the side trunk. And not only do they have that cover along the side, but then they have that browse. Also, we're allowing that sunlight by doing that to continue into this area. So we're providing sunlight on top of the briars, on top of the shrubs. We're putting trees down in the ground and horizontal to complete more side cover and that actually give them hardwood browse and regeneration. So we're taking an open ridge top like this. We first started brush hogging, I should have mentioned that. Just brush hogged it, widened it out through here. So we're gonna keep sunlight hitting the ground. We're gonna get a lot of regeneration. We're putting the hinge cuts. The hinge cuts we're not using so that deer have that overhead canopy. That doesn't mean anything. So where are the deer gonna bet? The switchgrass in here will be six to seven feet tall. That'll act as a thermal barrier. So any wind blowing through here will hit that switchgrass and it won't proceed to the other side. So deer can actually nestle up on the other side of that switchgrass. And I would suspect they'd be right back here. You can see a little flat, just right into a location like this. 10 feet away, they could bet. They'll have hardwood regeneration, they'll have briars, they'll have woody shrub tips, and then they'll have the cover of the switchgrass. Now, if there's heavy northerly winds coming in from this side, as that's facing north, then they can just go to this side of the ridge. So a buck that's living back here has hardwood regeneration, he has woody shrub tips, he has briars, he has the thermal protection of the switchgrass, and then he can go to either side when it gets into November and December. Because really, where they're bedding at, if they want to bed right out here in the open, if they want to bed out in the shade in June, July, August, September, who cares? Because what, needs, what we need is to have this bedding area work for us in late September, October, November, December, January, so that we can predict this is where a mature buck wants to bed. He can take over the spot. And with the food plot behind Dylan about 60 yards, you can imagine as we proceed down this, this point, and you can see simply where I've, where I've brush hogged is simply where there's, there are no big stumps. There's no rocks, there's a lot of rocks. But this extends around the corner for another 100 yards. And so this is a pretty long point that we've established switchgrass. Now at the end of this switchgrass planting, we have a cluster of red cedar. So switchgrass meets the red cedar. We have hardwoods that will hinge cut on both sides and either side to complete this bedding area. We'll continue that sunlight here for the foreseeable future for decades to come. We can hinge cut on top of hinge cuts. A lot of these hardwood species, when you hinge cut them, you can hinge cut them for decades. It's not killing the tree. It's an actual renewable resource as opposed to hack and squirt or some of the chemical practices where you're actually killing the tree, girdling, and then you're wasting that resource. In this case, we're using the resource, producing hardwood rege regeneration, and then we're keeping that sunlight hitting the ground, so we're keeping an open canopy. And then on the very point down there, which will be about 160, 70 yards away from the actual food plot, then we can have a true morning bedding area stand where we're not walking in by the food, we're walking away from the food in between big food sources with two or 300 yards on either side, we're coming down in the cover and we're popping up to that and then we're blowing our scent off that. And it's a tree stand location that we set up last year. So what we're doing is we're taking the water hole out of there. We'll leave the mock scrape because we always have a mock scrape at every stand location. We're moving the water hole out here where we can get a lot more use out of it. And then we're creating even bedding, better bedding area in here so that we can dictate when we come into that morning area, that'll be a slam dunk morning stand hunting opportunity that we can get into right in the back side of a bedding area, right on the downhill edge of this point, so we can be rest assured that our wind will always blow off this ridge top, never get into a deer's nose. And we're not only creating a great bedding area in this situation, but we're creating a great hunt in the future with a great bedding morning stand opportunity. And if you follow my channel, you find out that the majority of my best box over the years have been taken in morning bedding area situations. And whether we access all the way from the east down in the bottom and come up, or we come in here from the west, go in between major food sources and the interior switchgrass and, and hardwood regeneration trail, 
the, and come up to that in the morning. We can walk through and around deer. We're not walking through them. We're not spooking them in the morning. We get into that location. And this can be an, even an all day hunt. We had a lot of bucks in here that were hitting this evening, morning, all day. And when we make this more secure, when we make sure that sunlight is coming to the ground, when we offer hardwood regeneration, then we can count on this as not only a great stand location, but a spot where we can hold and maintain a mature buck throughout the entire hunting season. And of course, we're complementing with this with food sources out here. Those food sources were not spooking. We're keeping them as daylight use so that deer are hitting those fields about an hour before dark every single day. They're filtering back through those areas in the morning. And that allows us to define that that's a morning stand. There's evening stands out there. But without that food source, we're not filling this area up with a mature buck every day. And at the same time, if we're spooking out that food source and we're over hunting it and we're spooking deer off it, then we're not going to have deer back here too. So it's an entire picture. A lot of times we're micromanaging these little just areas like this. It doesn't take a lot of acres. We're taking this, this combines the food plot there, there, distant food plots, water hole on the outside, all this for cruising boxes across a ditch line. We're putting that entire picture together to produce 15, 20 acres of incredible deer habitat with different stand locations, different winds for morning and evening. And this is one piece of it. It's what we do for our clients, what Joe, Kevin, Dylan, and I do when we look at client properties and design them around the country. We wanna make sure that this area fits to the next and that we ultimately produce a great hunt. It's not all about just this bedding area. Unfortunately, in the past, people look at creating buck beds and deer beds, and there's even lawsuits that have been taking place over that kind of stuff. But it was all about, we create this certain deer bed on your property, you're gonna attract every big buck into this location within a mile in all areas. They wanna to come to this bedding area. It's not about that. This is just a part of the entire picture of cohesive deer habitat movements and how you can link them together to create great access for both morning and evening in a variety winds in a very small compact location so you can have a great hunt, herd and a great hunt this fall. Now I'm excited again this year to host our Camp Kicking Bear charity event. Last year we did it in June and it was a big success. We were able to raise over 21000 for Camp Kicking Bear. There's some people that actually make comments that they get sick of hearing about this kind of stuff and whatever else. I think they didn't understand that we're actually raising money. This Camp Kicking Bear is to me the number one children's organization that gets kids in the outdoors, their families, especially a lot of kids that don't have the opportunity to do so otherwise. June 11th, we'll, I'll have more details coming out about this, but you can email us for early registration. June 11th, it'd be midday, you know, like 11 to four type thing, 10 to five, 10 to four. What I do is there's 50 people that register for this. We give that all to Camp Kicking Bear. Well, it's a habitat day. We go out for a couple hours on the property and I show you some strategies that you can take home to your own land. Number three, we have a hunt raffle for 100 people. The, the registration for 50 people is $300. That gets you in the door to actually see the property and the land. $100 gets you in a hunt raffle times 100 people. We had uh, Leo from Lower Michigan had a uh, hunt last year, many memories, uh, end of uh, September for a couple days. Number four, Lots of door prizes, Matthews bows, blinds. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that uh, we give away, really good stuff for you too. Kids are free. I think we had about 25, 30 kids last year. All proceeds, again, go to Kicking Bear. Every dollar, every dime we raise goes to Kicking Bear. We'll have some other auction. Last year, Chris B came. We might have Kevin Smith, retired Major League Baseball player. I hear that Gary Suter, he's a NHL Hall of Famer. He might show up too. So. There's some chance to meet there. And then, of course, Ray Howell. He was here last year. He delivered his testimony. It was an awesome, inspirational talk that he gave to everyone. Hope to see you there. Look for further details on the site and then the description for the video.